Hey, Aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man. Stan Osterman here on Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, we're getting to one of my very favorite subjects besides hydrogen. I mean, if you got to make a favorite subject besides hydrogen, it would be hydrogen and boats. And so we're going to talk about both of those things today because our guest is uh, actually, he's been on before, but it's, it's been a few years. I mean, actually several years. And um, last time he was working for the Department of Energy at the National Lab, Sandia National Lab. And he was actually out here in Hawaii doing a project with Young Brothers. And we got to work with him on some hydrogen and some, um, what we would call a stationary fuel cell, but it's actually a fuel cell that went on the barges to provide electricity for refrigerated containers. And it was all hydrogen powered. And so we've, we've uh, been tracking my guests for a couple of years now, and he's mysteriously disappeared from the national labs and started working on other maritime hydrogen projects. I would consider him one of the most knowledgeable individuals on applying hydrogen technology in the maritime world on the planet. One of the probably maybe out of three or four people that I'd really go to to uh, talk about the subject. So welcome to Joe Pratt. Um, he's uh, a long time uh, hydrogen fanatic, probably like me, um, but a lot more brainy than me and has worked with a, a lot of hydrogen systems. So Joe, welcome to the show. And could you could you introduce yourself a little bit about maybe a little of your background because you haven't been on for a while and then talk a little bit about what you've been doing the last few years uh, in California in the um, hydrogen maritime world. Yeah, sure, Stan. Uh Thanks so much for having me. I love being on this show and, and talking to you again. It's been a long time, like you said, too long. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, let's see. I am a hydrogen technology person uh, at the core. I've been involved with hydrogen energy since uh, back in graduate uh, undergraduate school in the late 90s. And actually, one of the first projects uh, I had to do with hydrogen was looking at hydrogen for boats at Crater Lake National Park. Uh, so that was a long time ago. I've uh, been involved with hydrogen ever since then, um, and mainly from an applications perspective. So where are the places where fuel cells make sense and hydrogen makes sense to be used? I looked at hydrogen for airplanes uh, in grad school, uh, really high altitude airplanes, and seeing how they work up at high altitude. As you mentioned, I was at San Diego National Labs from 2010 to 27, 2018, 2017, can't remember, uh, a while, almost eight years. And there I was focused on hydrogen deployment, fuel cell deployments um, into the market. And uh, the Department of Energy is very focused on light duty vehicles, but there are many other places where fuel cells can be applied. And so the, a lot of the questions that I was answering was, you know, could hydrogen work in airplanes, in construction equipment, in uh, maritime and boats, you know, all, all kinds of places. And doing that through studies and also uh, demonstrations, as you mentioned, Stan, the, the uh, portable port power system we had at Young Brothers is one result of that uh, big effort there. Um, so that kind of started the mar maritime um, focus of hydrogen from my perspective and actually kicked off Sandia's zero emission maritime program. Um, one of the first studies we did with hydrogen on the water was called the SF Breeze. And we set out to answer the question, could you power a ferry using only hydrogen fuel cells? And this was around 2015, 2016 when we asked that question. And at that time, it was a little bit crazy because we were really only looking at hydrogen for forklifts and cars, you know, five kilograms of storage, 100 kilowatts of power. And then people were asking the question, well, could we do a megawatt of power? Could we do a ton of storage or two tons? And it seemed like, no, you can't do that. Of course not. <laughs> you know? But the more we looked at it, we found abso absolutely we can. Um, it made sense in, in, from the study standpoint. Um, and so, you know, Following that thread a little bit, we found out it was technically possible. The regulators were okay with it. The economics would pencil out. Um, and we found through that study where we engaged over 200 people in trying to get the, the, the facts straight, that there was a real demand in the market 
for zero emission hydrogen uh, solutions on the water. Uh, but there was nowhere to get it from. So that's when I decided, okay, I want to help uh, show that this is possible, not just do a study and also provide a solution for the people out there who, uh, who want this. So started a company called Golden Gate Zero Emission Marine in um, early 2018. And we were kicked off with a grant from the California Air Resources Board to build a passenger ferry powered only by hydrogen fuel cells. Been working on that project. Uh, we announced a few weeks ago with our partners that it just launched to hit the water. Um, it's undergoing commissioning right now. Um, and in the meantime, we've looked at other marine markets. Uh, we won another grant in um, earlier this year from the California Energy Commission to do smaller boats, um, small harbor craft like patrol boats and, and also uh, applicable to things like recreational boats, water sports boats and things like that. We're really excited. Um, and just because I think of a lot of the work we've done in hydrogen fuel cells, we're getting a lot of interest from other markets outside of marine too. So we decided to rebrand to a more generic zero emission industries um, where we're, we, we do still have a marine focus, but we also are taking care of people in other areas who really want um, people who know about hydrogen and approach it from a, a solid technical foundation and are able to supply solutions. So that's, that's awesome. Kind of a long story short. Yeah, there's, there's got to be at least a half a dozen or, or more um, aviation companies that I know are getting ready to FAA certify their hydrogen and fuel cell powered electric planes. And, um, you know, you mentioned, though, that you were looking at a pure hydrogen powered um, ferry, um, but it does include some battery, too. Most of the hydrogen systems that I'm familiar with have some kind of battery system, and it's, it's usually, in fact, in the vehicles we used to make for the Air Force, we consider them either fuel cell dominant or battery dominant, you know, and, and there, so there was always like a ratio of which one had more of a play in the power powertrain. And we use the batteries a lot of times to smooth the power out or to give you extra boost here and there. But um, so actually we have a video of the um, sea change ferry uh, that you sent us. And could we run that video now and give people a look of it's, it's, not being in the water yet. I, you sent me one with it in the water, but I just wanted people to see the scale of this thing and some of the details on the boat. So if we could run that video. There yeah. it is, and you, it, you can see it's a pretty impressive boat. It's not a little tiny, tiny boat. Yeah, I, I can't remember. This video was taken maybe in the springtime, so before it got on the water, but it's uh, mostly complete by then. Um, it's about 73. 73 foot long ferry, about a 25 foot beam that's across. It's a catamaran, so two holes. You can see right here the hydrogen tanks up on the top deck. Um, there's eight long, about 20 foot long tanks there, and then two little ones tucked. Um, the little room there on the back deck was where the fuel cells are. Uh, yeah, so it's circling around again. Um, and then down in the holes, we have the electric propulsion system, uh, two. 300 kilowatt motors, one in each hole. And uh, there is a roughly 50 kilowatt hours of battery in each hole also, lithium ion. Um, but the holes are actually mostly empty besides right. a few things. We you know, eventually would want to get all the tanks down in the holes. Um, and there's really no reason we couldn't, according to the regulations. But as the first uh, one in the US, uh, uh, we wanted to make it really easy. And as everybody knows who's been watching your show, Stan, the best way to not have to worry about any safety issues with hydrogen is keep it in the open air. So yep. we, that was the approach we took on this one. Um, future ones definitely want to get that hydrogen in, down in the hole and let people enjoy the sun up on the top deck, though. That'd be good. Yeah, I noticed because you did send a bunch of other videos of a lot of the details down in, in the in the fuel cell and in the uh, battery storage compartments, and I I wasn't sure that would really carry over good in in this format. But I did notice that for the batteries there was a a pretty significant cooling system. It looked like you had glycol cooling for the batteries. Are those lithium cobalt batteries? Um, you know, I don't remember the the cathode composition. I I want to say they're NMC. So is the C for, for okay. cobalt. I'm not, I'm not a battery guy. I'm a hydrogen okay, yeah. guy. 
but because and, and you know i was i was because i work with paul poncio at blue planet on the big island they use lithium ferrous phosphate which has oh. much a much better safety record and when and even elon musk is switching from his lithium batteries that um, he's been having car fire problems with um, switching over to lithium ferrous phosphate so all of his his next generation cars are going to have um, a different battery technology which it actually performs similarly but it has actually has better cycle characteristics okay it's a much more recyclable and end of life product and it has very little thermal um issue very little few thermal issues at all in fact in the ones they use stationary at a, at a home they can be completely discharged and completely charged and the temperature in the cabinet goes up two degrees and there's no cooling system with it that's just and most of that temperature changes from the computer in the top that has a fan cooling it down and that drives some of the temperature change so you might you might want to think about maybe looking at those batteries um to uh to add an extra margin of safety on on the boats yeah it's interesting i mean you what you saw talk before about batteries and now you know one of the they're on a boat there's no way to regenerate or in, unless you have a sailboat there's some extra cases there but on a car, you want a battery so you can recapture that braking energy. But on a boat, you don't do that. So the need for a battery on a boat is really different. Um, and if you have a hydrogen fuel cell, which is zero emission, then you really don't need batteries unless you want to use them to smooth out some of these really high frequency transients, which could be done with a very small battery or even in some cases capacitors. Um, when we look at safety, in some respects, we feel strongly that hydrogen is even safer than lithium ion batteries. And one reason for that is if you have a battery fire, now the, 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 uh, the systems today are very good. They protect uh, against the fire getting out of the cabinet. But uh, if you have a battery fire, you can't do anything about it. It sits there. And if you're on a boat, you can't get off it and get away uh, if you're in the middle of the ocean. Sure. Uh, with hydrogen, if you have a fire, um, you exhaust the hydrogen and it's gone and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, the only way to do that with a battery would be to somehow rig up a system where you could eject it over the, the side of the boat. Uh, otherwise you're stuck with all that energy on board. And no, I, I, I agree. And, and as a boat owner and a boat designer, I can tell you that onboard fires are your biggest concern. That's why a, a lot of the commercial boats will go either diesel or bunker fuel as yeah. they're fuel of choice just because of the flammability issues gasoline is so flammable um, and has so much energy in it if you get a fire going with gasoline in a in a plastic tank it melts a tank it fills the hull you're up in flames it's it's really not good hydrogen is much much safer than um than gasoline for sure than propane for sure yeah. and um probably on par with diesel maybe even a little safer than diesel Yep, I agree with you, Stan. Yeah. So that um that catamaran, uh, I, I'd really like to give out. You chose a uh, catamaran for the design, yep. and can you give us some ideas on why you chose that and and the general purpose? You this is a boat that's used in in protected waters, so it's not ocean going, per se. You do have some fairly rough water in San Francisco Bay and stuff, but can you can you describe the design? Um, the designing of the hull itself and the purpose purpose built why why you picked that hull yeah sure um from some of the studies that we did at sandia you know i learned a lot about boats i wasn't really a boat person before then um part of the the main reason we chose a catamaran was simply because of the speed um if you want to do a monohull there's kind of a, a cutoff somewhere in the in the 20 to 25 knot range where it doesn't make sense um, to stick with a monohull and try to push that through the water uh, at those speeds. So naturally you transition to a catamaran, which is uh, more slender holes and gives you uh, less resistance. So it's more effective at higher speeds. Um, so that's really the, the main reason for the catamaran is this, this vessel has a top speed of 22 knots and we wanted to uh, have any, as efficient hull as possible. When you have really cheap diesel, you know, let's say back in the 20 years ago or so when it was less than a dollar a gallon, something like that, 
you didn't really care how efficient your hull was. You just burn a lot <laughs> more fuel. Um, but if you're burning a, a fuel that at least today is more expensive than diesel, then every little point in the efficiency of your system counts uh, a lot more than it does if you're burning diesel. So high efficiency hull uh, was the main reason for catamaran. The side benefit of that was that we could put the tanks up on the top deck um, and still maintain fantastic stability uh, because the holes are, are so spread out. It's such a wide vessel, um, but that wasn't the main reason. Um, yeah, it's really important to, like you see the boat behind me, that's my 33 foot uh, monohull. Um, I had a cat before and it was much faster, much more stable in, in rough water. But if I burn all my fuel out, that boat behind me becomes a little top heavy and has a fairly big sail area with that um, cabin. So I have to worry about stability with that boat, like you say, because when you put all the weight up high, now you have stability issues on a mono hull where you don't have them on a twin hull. So Stan, so, I'm thinking we should throw a few hydrogen tanks in there because <laughs> that'll give you the ballast to keep her upright and yeah. the fuel doesn't weigh much. And there you yeah. go. Yeah, actually, um, I'm, I'm looking at moving to the big island possibly. In fact, my plans are getting a little soft right now, but what the first thing I would build after I get the house done would be a twin hull boat to go fishing over in Kona. And uh, it would be an electric boat, most likely hydrogen fuel cell electric boat. Um, I might have to start off with some batteries, but I definitely want to go to hydrogen. But that's a good transition point. You, you talked about the um, Sea Change Ferry being one of the boats you're looking at designing, but you're also looking at designing different classes of boats, a little smaller, a little bit more like the one behind me. Um, what What's kind of driving that thought? Um, yeah, there's a few things there. So let me back up one little bit. We're not a boat builder or a boat designer. We provide the power system, the end-to-end -end hydrogen fuel cell power system, hydrogen tanks, fuel cell, integrated um, safety systems, which is a big deal in Marine, as you pointed out, um, all together in one package that anybody without any hydrogen experience can drop into their boats. Um, so what we've found is that the commercial, it's, it's more of a, a market um, influence on why we're looking at the small boat market. Um, for larger boats, they're almost always uh, unique. You might have similar looking boats, but every boat is a project and they are usually long timeline. Um, and it, that business is very difficult uh, in, it, as your only business to be supplying you know, engines into, which is basically what we're doing. If you look at any marine diesel engine company, marine diesel is only a very small portion. Um, they're supplying engines for other industries and they put some over to marine. So it's not really a sustainable market on its own. Um, the small boat market is different. It's more like the car market where you can make a single powertrain and it can be deployed into tens of thousands of, of vessels. Um, the same exact powertrain over and over again because it's going in the same exact boat over and over again. Um, so from a just pure business standpoint and us as a high growth venture back startup, that's really important that we have this uh, opportunity to scale very easily. It's also a big demand in that small boat market. Um, we're seeing not just in the commercial side, like for harbor craft, where regulations are getting much more strict on the kind of fuels you can burn in the harbor and the emissions, um, but also recreational. There are a lot of areas where we have uh, lakes and rivers. Um, the regulations are saying you you can only run electric motors, no more gasoline, no more diesel. Um, so we can provide a solution for that where batteries don't have enough range to be able to meet the demand. Um, I think people who aren't familiar with boats stand, you know, they look at a car and they think, well, that's a battery electric car. It works. Why do we need fuel cells? It's a lot less resistant to put a car that rolls on wheels through the air than it is to push a boat through water. Um, and batteries, even very large battery banks, won't last very long on even very small boats. Um, so there's a, a very big opportunity in boats of all sizes and a very near-term opportunity 
um, that we really like in the in the small boat market. The the um you began explaining the difference in the hulls, and one of the differences in a mono hull and why it can't go more than twenty five miles an hour is the boats that the the single hull boats that go over twenty four miles five twenty five miles an hour are usually planing hulls. They actually get up and on a plane and skim across the top of the water. Yeah. Well, it takes a lot more power to do that and get that speed um, than you could you can't even push like a boat like my, mine is a displacement hull. It actually has a little bit of planing characteristics to it, but I'm basically pushing through a non-compressible thing called water. Mm -hmm. And a car drives through a very compressible thing called air. And um, you're right. As soon as I pull the throttle back on that boat, it stops. <laughs> I mean, it slows down really quickly just from the water. So you have different dynamics in a boat. Um, and it takes quite a bit of different engineering and thought that goes into your efficiency and the size of motor and the speed you're going to work at. And I'd say even, even compared to cars, every boat is a compromise. It can either go fast mm. and use a bunch of fuel, or it can be really fuel efficient and you're going to probably have to go slower. I mean, it's, it's a constant trade-off, just like airplanes are a constant trade-off. And hydrogen always seems to help out because energy density by, by weight is it, hydrogen's got everybody beat. You just can't beat it. So I, I think that's one place where you, you guys have a big advantage. Yeah, and that's a, a big attraction of the marine market, you know, back going back five years or more and looking at this market and saying, there is a real need here. If, if you want to go to zero emission, there is a real need for a solution because batteries physically can't do it. So yeah, that's, uh, that's why we're working in here. Yeah, and batteries are much too heavy to have the amount of energy you need to push that boat through water. And if you want to go faster, you add more batteries and then your hulls are heavier and then you need more energy to push the boat that fast. You know, it's a yeah. it's that never ending. You just can't ever get ahead of the of the curve on that. So hydrogen has a lot of advantages and, and I think it's, I think you're in the right market. It may take a while to take off, but uh, I think you're there. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to take off a lot faster than any of us think, including me. But there's a lot of people interested out there who really want this stuff. So, hey, were you able were you able to visit the Energy Observer when it came through San Francisco? Yeah, yep, yeah, got um, was lucky enough to get on board and and walk around, and get a little tour there. Did Did you see their Toyota fuel cell? Um, I, I. I ducked my head down into the hole. I don't think I could see into the next compartment, but they pointed out where it was. Okay. Yeah, Paul Ponte over at Kona, when they stopped in Kona, got to really climb in there and, and, and get a look at it. But they have some videos on their website that look at the, they basically took a Toyota Mirai fuel cell and everything it took to, to make it into a drivetrain. And they put it into a, a pallet size package wow. that they forklifted into the side of the energy observer hooked everything up and that's their fuel cell for transportation yeah. and it's 114 kilowatts so and they, they actually have a small electrolyzer um, so they can either fill up with hydrogen at the dock or like you say it is a sailboat it doesn't have sails it has foils mm -hmm. um, that give it the propulsion but they can actually charge their batteries and make hydrogen by using the sails to move the boat forward and use the propellers to generate electricity, either make hydrogen or charge batteries. So it's it's a pretty neat system. Yeah, and they get water too. Yep, yep. I remember talking to them about, um, you know, they they have the sails, so they don't always, a lot of times they don't really need the, the battery or the fuel cell system to move around. Um, I was talking about when they came over to North America, it was right around the time when COVID hit and everything shut down and nobody would let them into port anywhere. I think they were up kind of on the Northeast, maybe into Canada. And so they said, you know, they really realized not only um, hydrogen fuel cells, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, so don't quote them on this, but this is my impression. Um, hydrogen fuel cells, of course, have this green uh, advantage, but during those month or so where they had to sit on the water they really appreciated the resiliency 
and the independence that you get from being able to create your own energy and then use it right on board and, and to use the water as well. I thought that yep. was a really good illustration of sometimes people look at hydrogen and they only think about the green benefits. But as you pointed out on your show several times, there is an energy independence aspect to it that um, could be much more important actually than the green aspects. Yeah, in fact, you know, when you think about it, what do you need to make green hydrogen? You need electricity and you need water. They're sitting with water all around them and they got solar panels to make electricity. And they could even make electricity from their motors if the wind is pushing their boat forward and it's turning their motors and making them generate power. So they could literally be making their own energy and storing it uh, on board electrical energy to be used for their instruments, for their computers, for their cooking, for everything that they needed to do. Yep. And you know, when you think about it, okay, if you can do that on a catamaran, well, then you certainly could do it for an island that could support a much bigger fuel cell and a much bigger, you know, power generation, you know, system, much more solar energy or high, you have choices. You have hydroelectric, you have uh, solar, you have wind, you have geothermal, you have all kinds of electrical sources you could be generating and storing power from instead of fossil fuels and it's all zero carbon. Right. So yeah, you're, you're right. It's, it's, you know, they were, they were forced into a situation where they realized the real benefits of hydrogen. And yeah. I think more people should, um, should take a lesson from that because it's really critical. And, you know, there's, um, when we were, when we had a lot of publicity around what we were doing with the, with the sea change water ground ferry, we would get calls from all over the world, really asking about technology and fuel cells and hydrogen. And, um, the idea that you could transform your, say, island state or country from being an energy importer to not just being energy independent, but an energy exporter is really powerful for a lot of countries around the world. Um, and they saw another tie in here to marine is they saw marine as a key enabler for that because ships use so much fuel. You could build a hydrogen infrastructure around a port, around a maritime use case with immediate um, uh, positive business case, and then be able to support, uh, kind of branch out from there to support your larger uh, ecosystem. So it, it all kind of came together in some really interesting ways. Well, I agree, and, and some homework for our audience, just go and look up how much bunker oil it takes to move a container ship from California to Hawaii, right. and then start saying, hmm, I wonder if we could apply hydrogen in a big ship like that and make it a lot greener. So we're, we're about in the last few seconds here, um, Joe, and I'd like you to wrap it up and, uh, and finish it off for us and uh, give us the last two, two words on hydrogen. Uh, Stan, I love one of your old shows. The title was Hydrogen is the Answer. Now, what's the question again? Uh, yeah, so that, that kind of sums it up. I think hydrogen can do, uh, hydrogen is the key to kind of a new world we're looking at here. I look at it as the oil age uh, from 120 years ago starting up. Um, there's so much opportunity there for people who had the foresight, and that's where we are with hydrogen. Uh, we're at the beginning of a, a new age here and it can do a lot more and has a lot more benefits than people think or realize. You're a wise man, Joe, Joe Pratt. You're a wise man. Nothing so like thank, this. Thank you for, um, for being on the show again today. It's been way too long. And, and in all fairness, I have to say you couldn't be on because while you were building those great, you know, that great ferry and stuff, you couldn't say much because it was all proprietary. So I couldn't have you on the show, but I'm glad we finally got the project done and we can get you back on the show. So we'll have to have you back on again in a little while and get caught up on, on some of your technology. Sounds a little great. Bit more. I look forward to it. Thank you, Stan. All right. And so until next week, Stan Energy Man signing off and uh, we'll catch up with Joe a little bit later. I, I think he's going to come up with some more really cool stuff for us to look at. Aloha. <laughs>